1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We are not to offend the unsaved Jews and Gentiles or the believers in Christ. Paul was an example of what he preached, and so should we. He admonishes them to be examples as he was an example of the supreme example, Jesus Christ. All right, look at verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Now Paul praises them here for remembering him in all things and for holding fast to the traditions he had handed down to them. First, First Corinthians 11 and 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, Paul is simply showing here that God is a God of order. Unfortunately, the phrase, the head of the woman, wife, the head of the wife, is the man, the husband, has been abused by male chauvinists. Chauvinist husbands in the world and in the church believes that headship means superiority, but it doesn't. Think about it. The same verse states that the head of Christ is God. Now, is God the Father greater than God the Son, Jesus Christ? No, they are equal. The husband is the head of his wife for the sake of order, but the wife is equal to the husband, just like Jesus Christ is, is equal to God the Father. First Corinthians 11 and 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Paul says here that whenever a man prays or preaches or teaches the word of God, his head are not to be covered. All right. First Corinthians 11 and 5, but every woman that prayed or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonored her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, it was a sign of dignity and honor. He says here that whenever a woman prays or preaches or teaches, she is to have her head covered with a veil. All right, look at verse 6, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shown. But if it be a shameful woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, this had a peculiar and particular application to the Corinthians. The unveiled women in Corinth or Corinth were prostitutes. Paul wanted them to wear a veil while preaching and praying. Why? Because he didn't want them to be identified as prostitutes and therefore bring reproach to the church of God. Now, this was a local application for the women in Corinth. Does it apply to the church today? No, that is not a part of our culture. Verses 7 through 12. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Now, the key word in this phrase is nevertheless. Adam was made in the image and glory of God. Eve was Adam's glory because she was made from him. God did not make Adam for Eve, but Eve for Adam. But since then, every man comes from a woman. Now, what do we see here? We see equality. The other key phrase is in the Lord. Jesus Christ brought about equality between the genders. The first Adam brought the curse, but the second Adam, Jesus Christ, restored and brought it back to the original state before the fall, which is equality. Every husband and wife equally needs each other. All right, 1 Corinthians 11 and 13. Judge in yourselves, is it commonly that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Now, again, Paul is seeing to it that the Corinthian Christian women do not be identified as prostitutes. When they pray or preach, they were to be covered with a veil. All right, let's look at verses 14 through 16. Do it not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. 
Now, the key word in this passage is custom. Paul gave good guidelines according to the customs of their day. Today, we have a different custom. But regardless of the, of the custom, we must always re remember that in all our Christian liberty, we ought to think of others and our testimony to others. And we should be guided by the principles Paul has laid down, and that is to glorify God and not to offend others. All right, let's look at verses 17 through 30. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also be hearsays among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper. For in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and, sh and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. There were many Corinthian believers who had taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, not recognizing and not reverencing the true essence of what these symbols stands for. When we take communion, we must understand that the cup of drink represents his blood and the unleavened bread represents his body. It is a celebration of his death, burial, and resurrection. If we are not doing this in our communions, we are taking it unworthily. In other words, in an unworthy manner, which is not pleasing to God. And because many of the Corinthian believers did this, many of them died and many of them became sick. Communion is not to be taken lightly. But neither is it something for us to be afraid of either. It is simply a time of celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me say this. Paul is not teaching that you have to be flawless to take communion. All of our past, present, and future sins were nailed to the cross by Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If our worthiness was based on our holy living, none of us would be worthy enough to take communion. Because no matter how spiritual you think you are, you still have flaws. We all do. It is not based on our holy living. The worthiness is recognizing, understanding, and reverencing what these symbols represent. And that is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The cup represents his shed blood for our sins. And the unleavened bread represents his broken body for us. All right, let's look at verses 31 through 34. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if a, and if a man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Now, Paul says here that if we take communion the correct way, we don't have to worry about being judged of the Lord. But if it is taken wrongly, judgment will come, and God does it that we will not be condemned with the world. Then he gives the solution to that problem. Eat at home before coming together to take communion. Then he says that he will set in order the rest when he comes to them.